Support for the Trailblazers.fm podcast comes from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, a vibrant network of leaders and organizations working on the ground to drive positive outcomes for our black men and boys. To learn more or to join and help CBME change the narrative, hop on over right now to tbpod.com slash black male achievement. You're listening to the Trailblazers podcast, where we will explore the stories of successful Black professionals. Join us as we highlight the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished trailblazers to help provide the know-how, confidence, and motivation you need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen Hart. What's good, Blazer Nation? I've got two really exciting announcements to share with you today. I found out this week that I was selected from a pool of over 600 applicants to be a speaker for the second year in a row at this year's Podcast Movement Conference. It's happening this summer in Philadelphia. So special shout out to Jared Easley and the entire team over at Podcast Movement for extending this honor to me to be able to grace your stage once again. I remember last year's event was actually my first time speaking publicly. And I remember coming into a room packed to capacity. I mean, people were sitting on the floor, standing along the walls in the back of the room, even before I actually made it my way to the stage. I remember being so nervous, but by the grace of God, (laughs) I got up on the stage and I crushed it. And I don't say that to sound arrogant, but I came into last year, right? Determined to jump off my cliff of comfort and begin the process of becoming an amazing public speaker. It's one of my 10-year goals to speak to an audience of more than 10,000 people. And I've staggered the goals over each year. So, you know, this is the beginning side of things where I need to get myself from talking to 500 people, to 1,000, to 5,000, and out to that 10,000 people goal out in 2026, right? But I knew I needed to get things going right now in order to get to that size of an audience years out from now. So a few weeks ago, some of you might remember, I did a solo episode talking about ways to blaze your own trail. And so I'm being transparent with you right now, ensuring that, hey, you know, I'm working beyond a podcast to keep blazing my own trail. And these are pieces, right? These are steps I'm taking to get there. If you missed the episode that I did, please go back and check that out. It's the last episode in the month of February. And, you know, as a brand and marketing geek, I love when I get a chance to help people with their branding and their marketing. And that brings me to my second bit of exciting news that I wanted to share. I'll begin hosting a free masterclass. I have one coming up this Thursday, March 29th, on how to brand, market, and grow your amazing personal brand. And this is going to be a value pack session. I'm going to walk you through the most important elements that you need to create a winning personal brand. And here's a hint. Your logo isn't even the most important part of your brand, right? Many of you have terrific products and services as entrepreneurs. And even those of you in a corporate world, you're crushing it at a high level. But if someone is to Google you right now, Google your name, there's not much coming up, right? Or what comes up is not really impressive. And it's clear that you are not deliberate about what is being created or having control over what surfaces for you in search. And, you know, the interesting thing here is that without the right branding and without the right digital footprint, which I call your online home, many people never find you. They're not going to find you or what they find about you is really not that impressive. And so they're not, they maybe don't buy from you or hire you right? Because the messaging, the branding, it's not clear, it's not deliberate, and maybe it just doesn't deliver the right impression of you up front, right? So if you've been given thought to developing your online home, and again, even if you are an employee, right? And you say, Stephen, I really don't see the value of me having a website. Let me ask you something. If you plan to coach or consult or author a book, or have some access to media, or you're going to be looking for a job and you expect that corporate recruiters or employers might be looking you up online, which they will be, you need to address and have control over the things that come up on that first page of a Google search for you, right? So again, 
if you've been giving thought to this or I'm stirring some interest in you, you want to go ahead and get signed up right away for this masterclass. We're going to cap our attendance at 100 people. So you don't want to miss out on this free session, this free wisdom, right? If you want to sign up, hop on over right now to tvpod.com slash webinar. Again, that's tvpod.com slash webinar. Our featured guest for today is Maxine Reyes. Maxine is a supercharged woman that wears so many hats, right? When she's not speaking at schools and mentoring teens, she's leading women's groups, teaching self-care and resilience and inspiring people with her platform, women leading their lives with courage and grace. She can also be found hosting couples retreats with her husband of 20 years or volunteering at her daughter's school. And she actually recently retired in December of 2017 after nearly 22 years of honorable service in the Air Force and Army, respectively. If that doesn't say enough, she's also a seasoned singer. And Maxine has graced the stages all over the world, right? and has a special surprise in store for our Blazer Nation at the end of today's episode that you don't want to miss. It's the first of a kind on the podcast. And I'll go ahead, ask that you follow Maxine over on Facebook or Instagram. Her handle there is at Sincerely Maxine, or you can find her on Twitter at Maxine Reyes Love. And I'll post all the links to all of her digital and social profiles over on our show notes page at tbpod.com. I feel so blessed as we close out another successful Women's History Month campaign. And I encourage you, if you have not yet done so, go back and check out the four amazing women that we featured for the month of March. That said, let's go ahead and get set to dive in and receive today's mission fuel from our featured trailblazer, Maxine Reyes. Enjoy. Maxine, welcome and thanks for being our featured guest on today's episode. Thank you, Stephen. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this interview. Yes. So we're closing out Women's History Month right now. And I wanted to have you kick us off, right? And maybe share a few of the women who have inspired you and and really helped to mold the woman that you've become today. The first person, the first woman I can definitely share is my mom. My mom, yes. yeah, definitely my mother. She has seven of us. Okay, I'm the only girl. Wow. She has six boys, exactly. <laughs> so you know the challenge that that is, right? I can yes. imagine. And so my mom just... Not a challenge us. for Ken. <laughs> Oh, actually, six, not really, because Ken is a great guy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they, they adore him because of the way yeah. he treats me, you know? So right. that's a good thing for him. <laughs> good thing for him, no. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> he would be I'm hearing sure. it from them. Any little boy early on was having a rough time with the brothers. <laughs> I'm telling you, but the good thing is they're all younger than us. Yes. Okay. So they actually look up to us. We lead the way and, you know, they seek advice from us. And so, yeah, seven kids, six boys, and just the way she handles raising us. I was raised with my grandmother most of the time, but just watching my mom, knowing that she had like low income and she never really stressed too much about not being able to afford things. She lived within her means. And then she raised the boys and they're all amazing boys. I mean, you have, we have no problems with them. They've never had any problems with the boys. So that's who I definitely can say she is the major, the woman that I look up to. Now, there are other women in my life. I think all the women in my family are strong women who I admire, but my, my husband's mom is another. A lot of folks, they, they're not fond of their mother-in-laws. <laughs> uh, you love yours, yeah. And I love I, mine. I love mine. <laughs> Man, yes. she is, um, she's amazing. She's a retired sergeant major from the army and wow. she is a tough cookie, but you know, she raised two boys on her own and just seeing how successful she is now, she did not allow any of the challenges that she faced to overcome her, you know? So she pushed through them, retired and have another job now, retired in Hawaii. And I just look up to her, you know, just the way she raised her boys and my husband, he's he's amazing. So it says a lot about her, right? (laughs) Yes, yes. So you're touching on your siblings. I know you're Jamaica and share something Mm -hmm. interesting about where you grew up. Ooh, so many interesting things of where, (laughs) about where I grew up and how I grew up. 
I think the, the, the easiest thing I can think of is me living across the street from school, from my primary school. Wow. So you would think that me being so close to school, I would be early every day for school, right? <laughs> <laughs> So I was on time most of the time. So what I did, and I think that's why I became really fast in track and field because I would sprint literally <laughs> seconds before the second, the tardy bell rings. Okay. Cause you know, they have the first bell and then the second bell. And yes. if you go after the second bell, you're late. I would hear the first bell ring, finish my breakfast and start sprinting. And I was known to be one of the fastest girls in the area where we grew up because of how quick I was. So one day I was late and the principal lined us up and spanked us with a leather government belt. You remember that? Do you remember the government <laughs> <Yes>. belt? <laughs> so you know what happened from there? I was never late again. So, <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That's a, definitely a story I wanted to share uh, me, of me growing up. I share with people all the time. And the, the second thing is walking barefoot to school. Wow. You grew up in Kingston, right? I'm a town boy. Yeah, so I, I'm a country girl. Yeah, I was born in Kingston, but I grew up in the countryside. And yeah, that's Whereabout? the one. South Manchester. Nice. Yeah, right by nice. the by the water. We you could see the cruise ship passing through. And yeah, I walked to school barefoot like the other kids. And so you can never forget that. Mm. Yeah. My favorite parishes. Yeah. <laughs> so Love that. Thanks for sharing that. So the unique thing, and I think what drew me to you online mm -hmm. was your military life, right? Yes. I wanted us to talk a little bit about that. I know this unique twist here, both you and Ken, I believe, enlisted in the Air Force mm -hmm. 11 years here, right? Before becoming an officer in the Army and serving another 11, right? right. Before retiring Correct. from your military life. I want to take you back for a little bit and maybe have you share what motivated the decision to join the military. Well, first, just to let you know, Ken is still on active duty. Yes. And so I just retired three months ago. But what motivated me to join the military? You know, coming from Jamaica, I have my family... No one had like a degree of any sort in my immediate family. So I wanted to be that first person to lead the way. So, you know, as I said, I had a lot of brothers at that time. It wasn't, I uh, didn't have six yet, but I wanted to make sure I lead the way because I was the oldest child. And so an education was important to me. And although I had the high grades to get a scholarship, I didn't know how to go about applying for those scholarships because I was just moving into the country and I didn't have the right persons to mentor me. And so I signed up for the Marine Corps and I didn't share that with you earlier, did I? <laughs> no, you didn't. Yeah, the Marine Corps. And I had my best girlfriend, who's also from Jamaica, as my buddy. So we have the Battle Buddy Program. <laughs> and wow. so I had her come in with me and we're in the delayed entry program. And so when she went to boot camp first... She said, hey, don't come to the Marine Corps, go to the Air Force. That's how I ended up going into the Air Force. <laughs> but the main really? reason, yeah, because she said it was, you know, the runs were longer and it was just tougher physically. And, you know, if she survived, I knew I would because I was more physically fit then than she was. But so that was, education was one of the main thing, reasons why I joined. The second thing was travel, just being adventurous. You know, coming from the countryside in Jamaica, I knew that if yeah. I came to America, there would be just a wealth of experiences that I could get into and opportunities right. as well. So being adventurous was a big thing. And I wanted to travel on the dime of the military because the military will get you everywhere, really. <laughs> if you don't have to pay out of pocket. You just do your time and serve. And so that was one thing that I definitely enjoyed traveling. And of course, coming into America, you know, knowing that there are tons of opportunities for me, just being able to serve, period, just service back to the country was a big thing as well. Mm, that's awesome. I think of the travel and I think of Jamaica, especially Jamaican people, we think of the negatives probably of traveling in the military, mm -hmm. meaning being deployed right, right. right into a war kind of environment. Mm -hmm. But to your point, you're sharing, and it's important to highlight that there are also positives in, Absolutely. in those travels when there isn't a war time, but you're still being deployed and being able to travel to different places, right? Right. And, and the thing is, I did not desire, of course, to deploy to the war zone. But once you raise your right hand and you know you're in the military, anything is possible. Right. So you're always prepared. Right. But there are so many people traveling to Germany, Italy, all these other countries just to be stationed. 
not necessarily mm-hmm. to be in exactly. a war, you know? And right. so those were places right. I really wanted to go. I ended up going to a few of those places, but I did. I went to the Middle East and that was a different experience for me. So I knew if I wasn't in the military, I probably would not have gone to experience the things that I experienced in Afghanistan mm. and Qatar and Kuwait. And so it's been a blessing and it brought a lot of light to things that are really happening outside of my world in the U.S., you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. We'll talk about some of the personal effects of that in a second, but mm-hmm. there are quite a number of people who aren't military aware, right? We don't understand the lingo of the military, but I'd, I'd love to maybe have you talk a little bit because you're the unique angle that you bring is that you've been in both the Air Force and the Army, right? right? And also, you were enlisted initially and then became an officer. So there's some really unique elements that I'd love to maybe have you expand on the differences, right, between the experiences of the Air Force and Army and then also the experiences of being enlisted versus being an officer. Well, for the Air Force, that was my, I was straight out of high school uh, when I went in there. So as an enlisted member, you're pretty much learning the basics, starting off as an airman, and then you become a non-commissioned officer. So the level of responsibility gets higher with the higher rank that that you gain. Now, being an officer is a different level of responsibility, uh, which is... So what's the requirement to become an officer? Is it like education or like what... Is that a trigger? The first thing is be, you have to have a bachelor's degree to become a commissioned officer. And so okay. after you get that, then you get to go to train to officer candidate school in the Air Force's officer training school. So I did the Army as an officer. So I went to OCS in Georgia, and that's the officer candidate school. And you learn all different types of ways to lead, but you also learn like a lot of military history and different schools that enlisted would not normally go to in OCS. So this training on becoming an officer and uh, not to fraternize with the enlisted core, you know, just doing like personal stuff off duty time, you're really not supposed to be fraternizing. Some folks are not mature enough to mm-hmm. separate friendship from the professional world. So right. if they're not mature enough to do that, then they'll try to talk to you the same as they would in the office when they're out. Right. So to prevent, that's just a small example or one of the examples, but to prevent that, that's why it's best to not hang out <laughs> with the other core. Yeah. Right. So one of the things that I'm unclear about, right? Mm-hmm. So being enlisted in the Air Force, does that not provide you the option to then transition to being an officer in the Air Force? Like yes. You, you need to go to another one of the branches? Okay, yes. It does give you the opportunity if they have positions open. So ah, so, nah. so is that the motivation more so to transition to the army? No. The, as far as posi- having positions open? No. So like, was that the motivation for you to transition to the army from the Air Force? Yes. To become an officer versus becoming an officer in the Air Force? Yes, they had more positions open ah, at, at the time. Now, it. do we want to stay in the Air Force at that time? Yes. But they were downsizing during that time. Got and they, they were trying to have a stay and they tried they offered me a position in the Air Force Reserve as an officer, but I wanted to go back on active duty so I can get my active duty retirement. Because the active duty retirement, you get it soon. You get it as soon as you retire. And the reserve retirement, you get it like years later. So I did not uh, want to have to do that, you know, because it's like working at a civilian job. So why not just right. go ahead and, you know, go active duty, do the tours and retire at 40. Boom. Yes. <laughs> and here I am. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, was it challenging? Absolutely. Because your freedom, you don't have the same right. freedom as you do when you're a reservist. So, you know, but that's a sacrifice you have to make if that's what you want, if you want to retire younger. Right, right. There's a, a wealth of this that might be lost on some of our listeners, but for especially for those of us that maybe have kids interested in the military, mm-hmm. I think there is mission fuel in you sharing that. So thank you very much for kind of being transparent oh, on you're that. Welcome. So in this transition, mm-hmm. right, to the army, you began working inside what is a male dominated organization, oh, right? Yes. And <laughs> you served your country, as you said just a minute ago, you're a young captain. I believe you shared that you'd led a team of nearly 700, majority of them being men. Correct. And also as a commando at the Orlando Army recruiting for a couple of years as well, right? Correct. Talk me through some of the lessons, some of the big lessons, the challenges, the failures that you learned having to lead others in that environment. Okay. So 
I would say as far as failure and things that I've learned from, pretty much started in OCS, in Office of Candidate School. Mm. So you're learning to lead at a different level than what you're used to. You know, I came from the Air Force as an enlisted member and I had a different point of view as far as leadership. Then I came to the army and it's more of a rugged environment. It's less of a, at the time anyways, is less of a pleasing the people. Not, you're going for the mission. You're trying to execute the mission and still trying to take care of people at the same time. But the mission was always the priority. And that's what I was taught once I joined, right? So mm-hmm. in OCS, I had an opportunity to lead, to be a platoon leader. And it's like a commander of a smaller group. And we had a four-day weekend coming up. And so you're leading your peers pretty much, but you're being you're being observed as to how well you do in these different situations. So we had the cadre, who's our active duty supervisors, and then we have the student leadership, who I was one of them. So I was the the commander for that week. And I made a decision that until this day, I regret making that decision in that way. And it was a soldier. His wife was pregnant and he was in training. So all of us are in training. We're not really supposed to go off post to see our families unless it's time, the time is granted to all of us. So this soldier wanted to spend a four-day weekend with his wife. Yes, she was pregnant, but no one else was going to be allowed to go and see their families. So he asked me, hey, you know, my wife is pregnant. Can I go and spend the four-day weekend with her? And I made a decision to not send him, you know. Mm. And what I learned from that, after I became a commander in real army life, not the training environment, is yeah. listen, any time away from your family, it's a lot of time taking away, period, you know. Mm-hmm. We have folks who are deploying all the time. These are real-time situation. Even though he was in a training environment, if I was pregnant before and if I had a child, I think that, that then I would have made a different decision because now my decision, yeah, because you have yeah. a different perspective. It's not also by the book, black and white. You know, there's certain gray right. areas where if you make that decision, knowing that, okay, this is real life. This is not training environment. His wife is really pregnant. Let the guy go and spend four days with his wife. I would have made a decision right. differently if I knew better, <laughs> you know, at the time yeah. I didn't. And so I do regret that decision. I, I've learned from it. So no, I do not make decisions like that anymore because I've been in that position and I've seen how I, I couldn't sleep, <laughs> you know. It actually kept mm. me up for several nights uh, knowing that I made a decision and I wasn't sure because I didn't want to get in trouble because if they go off post and something goes wrong, then I get in trouble and my supervisors get in trouble as well. There were Mm -hmm. other risks that could have occurred. And so I just wanted to mitigate the risk by not having him go, period. So yeah, I've learned learned from that. That's definitely a real life situation, although it was a training environment. Having had a chance to get to know you too, I can see where there's conflict in that personally from me observing you as a person who really lives to serve, like your mission is to serve people, right? So I'm sure there's a challenge in serving the mission and having to kind of neglect the personal. In- right, right. And, and you know, Stephen, since then, I've taken a lot of heat from my leaders because I made the mm. right decision that I felt deep inside that this is the right decision because this person is here to work for us. You know, we are their leaders. They're right. depending on us to take care of them for their welfare and their families. So I've made decisions since on the side of the soldier that later on they will remember when I have a project I need to get done and yeah, it may take a little bit of their family time, but they're going to do it because they know, hey, this needs to be done. There's a deadline. She helped me out earlier so I can you know, come in for a couple hours on a weekend to help her out, you know, to get the mission accomplished. So. And in that scenario, not keeping you up at night. Precisely, exactly. <laughs> because as I said, I am for doing my job, but taking care right. of the most valuable resource, which is our people, the people who work for us, people who we lead. Right. So you talk about it. I mean, was there a point that you kind of felt like you'd arrived at your signature style of leadership? Yes. I mean, using all those experiences in command later, yeah. I definitely, because I did, as I said, I did not want to lose sleep over it ever again, over a decision that I've made. And so I said I was going to lead courageously, but still gracefully. Hence, my platform for my motivational speaking is leading with courage and grace. 
still being brave, yes. still being effective in making these decisions, but still being graceful and humble and considerate of others, treating them with dignity and respect. I know you have a heart, and we're talking about this right now, for mentoring youth and teaching them the life skills that they need in the future, right? You're helping to mold what becomes their right. future. And you're doing this through several mediums, right? I see you involved in speaking and retreats and workshops and, and all of that. What are a couple of critical life skills that you see missing from the treasure chest, from the arsenal of this next gen? Ooh, <laughs> I've been the last time I spoke with a group of teenagers was last week, last Tuesday. Mm. And the first thing I can think of, which I believe is a common trait for this generation, is so if they see different points of view, when someone is giving them different points of view, they see it as a personal attack against their character. And so it's like it's hard for them, it's a hard pill for them to swallow when you're giving them advice, critique you know, constructive criticism. <laughs> they look at it as a, as a threat, yes. as you're attacking them. And so, and that's not the case. I mean, if they fall into this fallacy that they lose their ability to be subjective and to critically think through a situation. And I've been around them and they get emotional about too many things. I just feel that if they just take a moment to listen to us, the older folks, we have some kind of wisdom to provide, you know, and then they can see it from our point of view and know that we're just giving them advice, giving them wisdom for them to carry through to their life after high school or after whatever age group they are. They are just not, it doesn't take too much to make them upset over just the simple mm -hmm. things, simple things. And, you know, one, another thing I, I realized, too, is it's hard for them to say no. They rather ignore a question if they have to reply with a no. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it takes courage to tell someone no because this is a fact or this is what you believe in. But it's like they skip and dance around just a direct answer of no. You know, I find it interesting as a parent looking at because I can definitely agree with you. <laughs> On what you just shared a minute ago, I see it as well in even the kids around me and this millennial generation, a younger workforce coming in. As you approach motherhood, right? You're a proud mama. You're raising a daughter in a society different than where right. and when we grew up. <laughs> How do you approach? Because I'm sure you look at some of that and say, well, you know what? I'm going to train this young girl to make sure that doesn't. this is approached differently. When she enters that phase of life, what are some of the values and the life skills that you're working hardest right now to instill that is a little difficult right now? You know, there are not many things that's too difficult with her because she knows uh -huh. we've been teaching her that we are going to be her best teachers. Anything that she learns mm -hmm. from us, she's going to hear it outside, but she needs to trust what we teach her over what she hears out in the world. There's not just one set of values that we're teaching her. We're teaching her many. I'll share a few of them. Let's see. Okay. So respecting and valuing education. That's a big thing. That's something that was instilled in me. And I still keep that until this day because, you know, your, your grandparents or great grandparents try to instill certain things in you or your parents. In my case, it was my great grandmother, but some things really is not really relevant today because of whether it's technology or whatever it is, the world that you live in, but education mm -hmm. never fails. It never fades away. And so Victoria knows, hey, your education is very important. We want her to understand that she has the right to tell anyone also not to touch her, including her parents. That's another thing because of you know certain mm -hmm. ways you grow up, you get people, whether it's family members touching you in certain ways that's inappropriate. That's another thing we tell her. Do not fear saying no to someone who is touching you and you know that it's inappropriate. And I told her, including us, including myself and my husband, if she's uncomfortable mm -hmm. with it, say, no, I am not comfortable with it. And if yep. anyone else does that to her, she needs to not feel that we're going to blame her. She needs to be able to tell us because she has total yeah. control over her body. So that's another thing. One of the things as you're sharing this, and I, I'm in alignment with you on that, how do you handle the element of winning and losing with, you know, with respect to mm -hmm. activities, education, right? Like kids today, I, I see, especially in like a classroom <laughs> setting, you get to the end of the year, everybody gets an award. Right. <laughs> oh. Or in competition, yeah. like my daughter is highly competitive, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Like every Sunday 
is a ritual that she and I will play a game, okay. right? Of some sort. Right now, we're recording this in March, in the middle of March Madness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She has uh, just finished, a, you know, the first time I've ever done a bracket, but she did a bracket. And she the second she walked in the door, she's like, how's my bracket, you know? <laughs> competitive so she's very competitive yes. very competitive and loves to win but also really takes offense to losing oh my. and you know it's it's this process right now that we're working through where i embrace the failure mm-hmm. you know to mm-hmm. me the failure is how she learns right. right right and so i encourage that as an entrepreneur in me is like no fail and fail you know as much as you can as fast as you can because this is where you're going to learn you know yes and be able to grow and do you see key. that? Do you feel that too? And I do. in this generation, maybe not so much from your daughter, but you know, are you kind of working through that a bit too? Well, I'm, I am working through it with her and some of my younger brothers. The youngest one, uh-huh. he's, he's 17 years old. He just graduated high school. My daughter is around me every day. And so both my husband and I, we want her to have tough skin. So that, that's another thing yes. and be resilient. So you have to take losses. It, it's okay. If you made a mistake, you're going to just learn from it, but know that it's going to happen. Know that you're not going to win all the time. She is very competitive when it comes to say track and field. Yes. And so because she knows that if she doesn't train, someone is going to beat her. (laughs) But if they beat her, it's okay. That means she has to train harder, you know? So these are things that we have been instilling in her as well. Just knowing that. And for example, Christmas time, we have the black Santa do you remember that game? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. That <laughs> oh my God, that's, I think that's the name of it. But it's, you bring gifts. Everyone who is in the house brings a gift, wraps it, and then we don't put a name on it. So you get to pick one gift. And if someone likes it, then they take it from you. Dirty Santa. Uh-huh. That's it. Dirty Santa. So if they, I know what you're talking about. I was doing the name of yeah. it. Yeah. So if they like it, they take it from you. And then you can't cry. You know, so you have opportunity to take that back from them. But if you never get an opportunity, just know that it's not, you're not going to easily get what you want. So be ready to play that game and be ready to lose, (laughs) period. So that's where we started. I think it was like three. She wanted to be a part of it. And I was like, don't cry, Victoria, if you don't get what you want, (laughs) you know? So she's been playing from them and she understands and she's like, okay, all right, I'll be a good sport, (laughs) you know? So that's some of the ways that we've been teaching her just by the simple things. Yeah. Good stuff. So let's switch gears. I wanted to spend a little bit of time and talk about marriage because you have a heart for this topic. Oh, yes, yes. I think that's where we'll end up in in the long term, just strictly doing marriage, (laughs) marriages. (laughs) And, you know, I mean, from the opening of this episode, I've been mentioning this guy named Ken. And I I didn't really explain who Ken was. I know. (laughs) Ken is my husband of 20 years. May will be 21 years. Thank you. Wow. No more teenagers, okay? Why I feel like a rookie. I'm celebrating 10 this June. Listen, you're at a <laughs> milestone. 21, 21 is awesome. Thank 21 you so is much. Awesome. Thank especially, you. And especially for that fact that you just highlighted is that you've been, you got married at an early age. Yes. So it's amazing to kind of see that, you know, as you mentioned, Ken is also in the military. Yes. Together, you do quite a bit around helping pouring into other marriages. You guys are involved in retreats and workshops. Mm -hmm. You recently authored a book. Yes. (laughs) Tell us the title. The title is Happily Joined, The Secret to Relationship Resiliency. Yes. And so I'm thinking about this Mm -hmm. and looking at your platform and Marriage of 20 Years has enough challenges of its own, right? Especially, you know, from, you know, getting married in your teens, but compound that with the military life Mm. for two of you. And I'm sure there are some really difficult seasons in that. Before we talk about your relationship specifically or marriage specifically, I'd love your thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. On what some of the things that single folk, single people wrongly assume about being married. Oh, (laughs) the list can go on and on and on. (laughs) Wow. So something that stands out, getting married does not resolve. It doesn't solve unresolved issues. We find so many people that think, okay, this person is going to change. He has these issues now, but once we get married, it's going to be okay. Uh You know, for example, having a baby with someone because you feel that that's going to keep you, get you guys closer. 
it's not going to get you closer. It will not fill that emptiness that's missing or make your relationship more secure. So do not Or change the characteristics of the person, like change your behaviors. Precisely. If you're seeing signs before you get married, run. Kristen and I have a a weird way of terming that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Kristen and I like to say you bought that coat. (laughs) You bought that coat, exactly, you know? Right, like you saw that and you purchased it, right? And yes. and we even, we jokingly even say that to each other, mm-hmm. right? You know, if there's a habit, no, that you don't like, mm-hmm. and it was that way before or Precisely. vice versa. Yep. Right? My wife is a project manager, amazing organizer mm-hmm. of, you know, work, but inside the house, she's a mess maker, right? Yes. And <laughs> she'll laugh about something like that and be like, yo, you bought the coat. Exactly, you know? right? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, to that point, right? Like mm-hmm. behaviors and, and characteristics yes, don't really you cannot change. change them. Absolutely. So either you accept them as they are, work with them, you know, or just bolt it like you saying. <laughs> <laughs> Run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so talk to me about for you and Ken over 20 years, what's been some of the best and hardest parts? Of being married, oh, man, there and we we share some of those in our book as well. The best part, because we did the military together and we did it mm-hmm. since we graduated high school. The best part is having him as my battle buddy from day one, from the, the time right. that we decided we were going to do this together until today. Like he understands all the challenges that I went through, and he feels that I went through more than he did because of me being a woman in the military. And so he, you know. He tells me all the time, he says, I feel bad for, for women, period. <laughs> but he knew, he knew that I had it a little bit more challenging than he did because of the expectations. And, you know, there's double standards everywhere. It's not like the military. It's not highlighted as much in the military as it probably is in the civilian world. But mm-hmm. certain leaders make up the military. Different leaders make up the military. And so different leaders have their expectations of, you know, us as leaders. But then when you're a woman leader, I think a lot of them take, they have their biases, And so it's not like the military encourages, you know, you to be biased towards someone because of, you know, their background or because they're a woman or whatever, but it happens. And so I've been lucky and sometimes not so fortunate. So Ken, having him as my battle buddy, getting sound advice from him, even when I don't want to hear it, (laughs) I I always knew that he was always going to be there for me. And so it helped my career. Your biggest fan. My biggest fan and my biggest critique and that the person I trusted the most and, I, and still today trust the most because he's going to give it to me as it is, period. <laughs> or some hard parts of that journey. The hard parts of the journey is really the military keeping us apart, man. You know, dual military lifestyle is not, it's not easy. And so oh. we spend, for example, b- right before I retired in December, we spent five years apart consecutively. Wow. So not wow. living in the same household. Yep. And the first 12 months I was overseas. So I only got to see him and our daughter once. And that was on our R&R when I you know, took two, oh 10 days gosh. off. Yeah. <laughs> the first of the five years was overseas in the Middle East. And so when I came back to the U.S., we were stationed apart because of our jobs and our schedule. We were not able to like move in the middle to be together. So we just saw each other on some weekends and until he went off to Kansas City. Then I went to Texas and we would fly to see each other there. So, it, you know, it, it costs a lot of money for us to travel to see each other back and forth. But we knew it was worth it because, I mean, th- we're each other's best friends. Keep a healthy this and is happy our, marriage. Yeah, right? ha- mm-hmm. happy marriage, healthy marriage. We have a child to parent. I mean, we got to make it happen. And so that's a choice mm-hmm. that we made. Some people just give up and, and they quit. But that wasn't in our vocabulary. You know, we were going to make sure that we make it work. And that's what we did. We did whatever it took to make Make it work. And so the hardest years are over because now I'm retired and now I can be home with them. And if I have to leave, I don't have to ask someone, can I go on vacation? Can I go on leave? My husband and I agree on, hey, you can do this at this time. And then I come back home and make sure anytime he's off from work, four day weekends, like this weekend, I'm home. So we have control over that now, you know? Mm-hmm. So we have other married couples or maybe even those who look into into marriage, right? Right. And I'm sure there have been military folks listening to this that are going to be able to derive wisdom in this. But what's your advice for those who are looking to keep or maybe even refresh things a bit, right? And as we just talked about, you know, get back to that happy and healthy state in the marriage. 
Happy and healthy state sounds like my tagline, our tagline for Happily Joint. Make happiness last. <laughs> Make happiness yeah. last. So yeah. really, it, it comes down to communication. Clearly, uh, I mean, seriously. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in agreement. You Absolutely. Know? Communication. Total, total agreement. Clearly and concisely vocalizing your issues. I'm talking directly to the wives and husbands out there. You have to communicate with each other. Each spouse needs to submit to each other. Take your ego down a notch <laughs> and be open to hearing the concerns of the other. Talk to each other about the things that make you unhappy, like Ken and I do. We have open dialogue in a non-threatening space that no one's going to start yelling and screaming at each other. We set the expectations first before we have these dialogues. And you'd be surprised how having these types of conversations work. I mean, just setting the tone and the ground rules prior to that dialogue helps. Uh, now, I mentioned black and white earlier in another uh, situation, but there's black and white and then there are the gray areas. And many couples, they hide out in the gray areas and not choose what their priorities are. So just stop sweeping issues under the rug. Don't hide the feelings from your spouse. I mean, you just can't and just talk about it. Talk about it. Well, I feel like it creates a snowball effect, right? Where you create these assumptions and you don't vocalize them. Mm, we're not mind readers. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know that it's a universal, I know I'll fess up and say, you know, my challenge in my marriage is listening. And I, I find that every man have a, that struggle, right? We, right? we sometimes just tune out, we're living in our work, in our mind. Even today, you know, I've become much better at it through the process of podcasting, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Has taught me to really listen, right? To what someone's saying. But there are several times a week that Kristen's like, dude, I told you like three times. <laughs> it goes right away. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, about that. Yeah. But, um, but I think, you know, really trying to dial in and as you said, you know, have a space where you're open to receiving what that other person is feeling and experiencing and, you know, take it. I've had to take myself kind of out of my own box and look at things from her vantage point, especially as it involves parenting mm -hmm, mm -hmm. today, right? She's a career woman. And sometimes I look at it and the more closely I look at it, even in the last couple of years, I realize as active a dad as I am, mm -hmm. she's carrying 75% of the weight uh -huh. and the responsibility. You know, just naturally women are inclined to, again, you know, she's the organizer of our lives. I, I find that I'm the organizer of our house, right? But you ask me, for example, about like kid related medical stuff. I couldn't tell you the first thing about anything related to our kids <laughs> medical, right? But, you know, like we could have a fight about, oh, you know, I'm doing too much or, or whatever the case may be. Right. But like, if I'm not open to the idea that, okay, you know, look more closely at what her argument might be in a scenario like that. Right. Right. You know, it could be closed door and then you kind of leave the other partner to, to still being frustrated because, you know, one party not, not open. Right. But yeah, I love that thought to, you know, being open to that dialogue. You have to, you have to, because then you, you boggle all these things up and then later on you flare up and burst out in anger from something that happened like six months ago because you don't talk about right. it. Right. That's a good one. That's a good one. I know you have a mission. You have so many things happening, girl. <laughs> But, I know God has blessed me. And sometimes I'm like, why me? All these things. I don't get to focus <laughs> like on one thing, like everyone else, <laughs> all these things. We're getting close to the end here. Right. But before we kind of wrap up, I know you have, we talked about the marriage piece and motherhood. You have this mission where you've expressed your desire to help women and mothers and wives live their best lives. Now, just speaking openly. And what is your advice for women who want that to live their best life right now? Living your best life right now. <laughs> Just don't hesitate. I'm going to go with an advice for my ladies out there, for the Blazer Nation women. Don't hesitate to see the things that are most meaningful to you right now. I mean, as women, we have so much pressure to be perfect and to please others because we're nurturers. And it, it, this happens so naturally. But just start doing the things you love. Stop trying to be so perfect or, you know, just by sticking with ideas that you no longer desire. You know, if you openly share something with someone because of accountability purposes, that doesn't mean you can't change your mind. 
you have all rights to change your mind. But sometimes like, and I'm talking about this because of something I've felt before mm. where, okay, I have these five things that I shared with my best friend and I said, I'm going to do them. But then other opportunities arise and I'm here stressing that, oh my gosh, but I already said I was going to do this, yeah. but it's no longer relevant. You know, so yeah. we add all this additional stress to our lives when we can just really just switch, switch yeah. to what's relevant today. So, you know, don't be afraid to do that. Another thing, don't be afraid to fail. Like uh-huh. failure is an opportunity to learn and it improves you to go and try something and get it better the next time. So uh-huh. allowing fear to restrict you and hold you back, that's a no-no. Take things with a stride. I think to add to what you just said, I love that you actually just said that mm-hmm. about accountability. Now, I'm a part of a mastermind group and on a weekly basis, every Saturday morning, four of us mm-hmm. jump on a call bright and early and kind of talk through what we have happening and we're able to hold each other accountable to our respective goals. But I love that you just highlighted, like, you don't have to be tied to what you said, you know, because as you push through working towards each goal, things will happen. You'll discover and unpack certain things that might require to course correct and pivot. And I think the the important piece right there is that you also, just like in a marriage, you have to be able to communicate. Oh, yeah. To your business partners, to your mastermind, you know, accountability partners. And be Uh, flexible. And be flexible and just be able to voice the why, right, Mm -hmm. to them as well. Because even too, you might be course correcting, but in voicing, sometimes you think things through in your head Mm -hmm. and is one thing. But then when you start talking it out, you know, and speaking it out, hey, you know what? More more heads kind of thinking through a thought sometimes gets different opinion to help expand or fast track that process. Yes. Or sometimes when you hear yourself say it out loud, uh-huh. it just sounds like nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> then you're like, okay, maybe we don't want to go there. <laughs> and, and, and you realize like, maybe that's not a good idea. Right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. But at least you think about it, right? And yes. you say it out loud and even yes. sharing it helps. Yes. Even yes. sharing it helps. So yeah, it just takes off that pressure. You know, we have so many things, so many requirements that we got to fulfill. And sometimes it just, just take a moment to breathe. You know, yes. take a moment to breathe. <laughs> Love it. Listen, I could keep talking to you for a good bit more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but we're kind of hitting time here. Before we let you go, there are a couple things that two last questions here that we ask all our trailblazers featured on the podcast. And the first of the two is I'd love to maybe have you share some books that you've read recently okay. and that you'd want to recommend to others. Okay. As far as books, I read a lot of self-help and motivational, inspirational books. But the most Love recent it. one, you know, just to, I'm going to share it with my ladies and then I'll share something for everyone, is mm-hmm. True Woman 101. And that's by Mary Cassian and Nancy Lee Demos. It encourages mm-hmm. you to dig in the true heart of manhood and womanhood. Wow. And it discovers the beauty, joy, and, and just fulfillment of being exactly who God created you to, you to be. And so it, it says True Woman 101, but really if men read it, they can learn a, a lot too. You know, So I encourage men and women to read it. And of course, I would be remiss if I don't mention Happily Joint, The Secret to Relationship yes. Resiliency, because we have tips for him and her from yes. him and her. So my husband wrote his tips while we were separated geographically. He wrote his tips and then I wrote my tips. So it's for mm-hmm. him and for her. Just to share a couple of the tips that we shared in the book from me is to stop trying to control him. He's not your child. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. going back to, you remember the tip that we said earlier, before you get married, there are all these things, these characteristics that you're trying to run from, but you still want to marry him. You can't control him, so don't even try it. But if you're already in a relationship, roll with the punches. Know that you cannot tell him everything that he has to do because he's not your child. You guys got to talk about it. Ken, he shares, communicate your sexual desires because that's a Mm. big thing for men, mostly men. (laughs) And so he is telling, you know, the guys, make sure that you tell her what you want because if you don't, you're not Mm. going to get it. But you got to talk to her. You got to talk to her. So those are two. <laughs> I want to actually insert one okay. in here because I find that it's relevant for the conversation. Okay. It's a book I read tail end of last year, and we actually had the author. Her name is Tiffany Defu, and the book is called Drop the Ball. I'll write that um, one down. And Drop the Ball. Yeah, I think it would be a great book for you to add to your reading queue. But it really is geared to women, but I found so much value in reading it as 
as a husband and as a father. And it, it really highlights the journey of a career woman, also a wife mm-hmm. and mother, and trying to manage all of that, okay. right? And we kind of touched on some of it before where, you know, that's what helped me to realize like, oh, as much as I thought I'm active, I realized I was probably carrying 25% of oh, the balls, okay. mm-hmm. right? And so it helps, it really is to, geared to helping women realize that and be aware of that and understanding that they can drop some of the balls, right? And allow their spouse, their partner to kind of help more. But it was great for the guys, for me, to see that angle of thoughts from a, a mm-hmm. career woman and to be able to kind of embrace that. And it, it's helped me at home quite a bit. So I, I'd highly recommend for both our women and our men to consider Drop that read the ball. as well. I'm definitely going to gonna pick that one up. Drop the Ball by Tiffany Defu. Yes. The Tiffany was on our podcast. Could be episode 98 if you want to go back and for those wanting to listen to that episode. Our last question today, and then we'll let you go. Um, One more question, Stephen. <laughs> maybe two, but let, <laughs> our last question here. Our last question here. What's one action that our Blazer Nation should take this week that's going to help them to blaze their trail? So I'm your first military guest. Did we share yes. that with everyone? <laughs> yes, we did not. <laughs> so as we your first not. military guest, I'm going to use a military term, right, that everyone can relate to. Do you know what a commander is? I'm going to say a leader of... Okay, so leader, leader of people, right? And for us, we are the commanders of our own lives. Mm-hmm. So as commanders of our own lives, Blazer Nation, <laughs> I recommend that you take a solid evaluation of all the people closest to you in your life. This is what I want you to take away and the action I want you to take this week. Relationships you've built throughout your life, whether it's personal or professional, decide which ones are holding you back. Because sometimes those you keep around are the ones that are toxic for you and your business. So decide which ones you need to let go of and which ones you need to nurture and do so with courage and grace. Preach the thing, my sister. <laughs> Preach the thing. I love that. Yeah, listen, we have we have I people in our that. lives, man. That you know, we just need to let go because it's, it's like baggage you're, you're traveling with. You know, yes. drop them off the airplane. Drop them off. Yes, yes. So listen, yes. we've been talking for almost an hour. Okay, and, <laughs> and I enjoyed it. I can't believe so this. many things, uh-huh. right? That you're into, and yet I have not shared with our audience. That you're also a seasoned singer. Oh, Lord, have mercy. He's going to put me on the spot. <laughs> you grace the stage with dignitaries and entertain the troops and NBA opening ceremonies. <laughs> yes. Max, I have not had a guest sing any kind of tune on this podcast. Wow. So I'll be a first. First military what? and a first singer. <laughs> You don't want to close this out with a tune? Sure, sure. Oh my. So this is going to, if I'm going to do this, this is going to be something that they probably have not heard because it's going to be okay. an original. It's going to be an original song. Listen, everybody, I just going to do the promoting. So you didn't have to self-promote. Okay. <laughs> Max have some songs that, you know, she's put out like, My Love is yes. on Fire. Is that the title oh, of the that song? W- Boy, that's I not this you. one. That's not that's, this one. I'm just going to share something you've never heard. I'm just saying, like, you can download that on iTunes because it's in How my nice. playlist. And Thank I love you, it. Steven. Love it, I love it, love it. I appreciate it. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, take us okay, out. Okay, so I'm going to share Joy Unspeakable. And it's a song that I co-wrote with a friend of mine. And it's a song to inspire folks who are in a certain situation and have people in their lives just trying to take their joy. And it, it's going to remind you not to allow anyone to take your joy. So I'm going to do the chorus and I'll do the first verse so you can really you know, hear the lyrics. Okay? Thanks, Max. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> this love I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, they can't take it away. This love I have, the world didn't give it to me, no. This joy that I have, they can't take it away. I've been knocked down, couldn't see, like the world was closing in on me. Then I learned how to rest in your love, it lifted me. You're my joy and my hope. 
Ooh, I couldn't ask for more. Never alone in the storm, no matter how the rain pours. This love I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, that can't take it away. This love I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, that can't take it away. <laughs> that is it. Love that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Woo! Maxine Reyes. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I'll be posting links to all of today's book recommendations and links mentioned on our show notes page at tbpod.com. If today was your first time listening to the Trailblazers podcast, I just want to extend a warm Trailblazers welcome to you. We're so happy to have you here and we encourage you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and browse through some of our past episodes to keep the knowledge flowing. If you're a fan of the podcast and today's content, and you're maybe already subscribed to the podcast, please continue to share and invite your friends, your family, your colleagues to listen to an episode that you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories will be moved to make significant changes that will have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday by about 5 a.m. Eastern. Trailblazers, jump off this podcast today. Go find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Cheers. Cheers.